Thomas Hamilton, 43, of Dunblane, Scotland, left his home at 7 Kent Road on March 13, 1996, with the sole intention of committing murder. He arrived at the Dunblane Primary School at 9.30 a.m. with a set of pliers, four handguns, and more than 700 rounds of ammunition. When he arrived, he cut the telephone wires on a nearby pole and then walked with his weapons to the school's side entrance. In the middle of a gym session for a class of five- and six-year-olds, Hamilton barged into the assembly hall and started shooting. He started off by firing at a few of the teachers. The terrified kids sought to hide beneath chairs and in closets, but Hamilton turned his pistols on them and shot at them. Screams resounded throughout the gym as little bodies fell to the ground covered in blood. Hamilton briefly left the gym and into a hallway where there were additional classrooms before reopening fire. Before Hamilton went back to the gym and started shooting once more, a number of further victims were killed. He then pulled the trigger while holding the rifle in his mouth. He passed away instantly, leaving a horrifying trail of destruction and death in his wake. Seventeen individuals were killed in the violent rampage, including sixteen youngsters and one teacher. Seventeen more people would live through the horrible catastrophe, but they would always have nightmares. The atrocities of that day left a lasting impression on the tranquil, rural village. The slaughter was regarded as one of the bloodiest in recent memory. The senseless massacre that claimed so many innocent lives and left the survivors physically and psychologically traumatized stunned the families of the victims and the locals. One of the thousands of cards given to the school to remember those who had passed away, according to John Smith's March 1996 story for the people, perfectly captured what most people were thinking. Why them? Why them? Unfortunately, no one was left alive to provide an answer. The only thing the authorities could do was review Hamilton's past to hunt for any potential clues. They believed that by learning more about him, they would be able to stop another atrocity like this one. It was unsettling what they discovered about Hamilton. On May 10, 1952, Thomas Hamilton was born at Glasgow Maternity Hospital in Scotland. His parents, Thomas Watt and Agnes Graham Hamilton, were already divorced at the time of his birth. There had only been one and a half years of marriage. In the Scottish Daily Record and Sunday Story by Kevin Mancy from March 1996, it is stated that Watt abandoned his wife Agnes and their unborn child in favor of another woman. Hamilton never had the chance to meet his biological father as a result. Agnes, who was at the time a hotel chambermaid, struggled to make ends meet. In Cranhill, Scotland, she made the choice to relocate with her adoptive parents. She thought that while there, she would be able to make some savings and give her son a secure home. Hamilton's grandparents adopted him when he was two years old. They made the child believe they were his biological parents because they thought it would be best for him. Additionally, Hamilton was taught that his biological mother was really his sister, a claim he held until being informed of the reality in 1974 until they relocated to Stirling when Hamilton was 12 years old. Hamilton lived with his grandparents in Glasgow's East End. Later, he moved into a home on Kent Road with his grandparents. Hamilton studied well in the neighborhood schools while he was there. His main teen interests, though, were split between the boys' brigade and a local rifle club. He spent the majority of his adolescent years and adult life consumed by his fascination with guns and the boys' club. His interests actually turned into a form of obsession. Hamilton began his gun collection when he was in his mid-twenties and earned a firearms certificate. He bought and sold five weapons in 1977 alone. As the years went by, he kept buying even more. In order to improve his shooting abilities, he also joined numerous local gun clubs and actively practiced there. In the 1970s, Hamilton also became more and more active with the Boy Scouts. He was chosen to serve as an assistant scout leader for a troop of scouts in Sterling in 1973. During that period, he was the subject of a number of significant complaints that raised questions about his ability to govern. Hamilton led a scouting group of around a dozen lads to Aviamore in the Scottish Highlands that winter. Their van broke down when they got there. Hamilton and the boys were forced to spend the night huddled in the car in the bitter cold because there was nowhere to stay. A few weeks later, Hamilton took a different group of scouts on a winter trek to test their survival skills. Hamilton's test, however, went well beyond the scouting threshold and into dangerous territory. Many of the little boys were drenched when they arrived home and had minor hypothermia. Hamilton's carelessness infuriated the boys' parents and scout leaders. The district and county commissioners demanded Hamilton's resignation. Hamilton, though, believed he had done nothing wrong and was incensed that his leadership skills had been questioned. As a result, he sent multiple letters of criticism to the Scout Association and headquarters in Scotland. He even demanded an investigation into what happened. There was no escaping the reality that Hamilton put the boys' safety at danger, and he was ultimately compelled to submit his resignation. Hamilton made the most of his extra time by working at his do-it-yourself store, 
Woodcraft, which he founded in 1972. But eventually, his firm began to fail as product sales dropped. He subsequently focused his efforts on starting a new company. Boys clubs were established by Hamilton and Sterling and the surrounding area, as well as in Dunblane. He spent the rest of his brief life focused on the projects. Additionally, they would damage his reputation in the neighborhood. In the 1970s and 1980s, Hamilton established a number of boys' clubs, many of which catered to youngsters between the ages of 7 and 11, in order to host a variety of club activities, including football, gymnastics, swimming, and target practice. He frequently rented out or borrowed space at nearby schools or gymnasiums. The clubs in Hamilton attracted a lot of members and were frequently popular. However, due to his increasingly bizarre behavior over time, membership quickly plummeted. Boys who frequented the clubs frequently stated that Hamilton would drill them like a cruel boot camp instructor. He would coerce the boys into difficult situations and reward them for being silent. Due to the volume of complaints, Hamilton's clubs were investigated by the local police. In his March 1996 story for The Mirror, Jonathan Russell stated that Hamilton relished correcting his boys and expected them to execute his every command. Hamilton's mother reportedly complained that they were forced to massage suntan oil all over bare body as he writhed and groaned in ecstasy, according to Russell. Hamilton's perversion became more and more obvious as the complaints poured in. Hamilton was ecstatic about his boys. He was so proud of them that he had pictures of them all throughout his house, wearing the skimpy swimming costumes he made them wear. However, after receiving numerous complaints, the police were unable to locate any conclusive proof that he was engaging in any illegal activity when they searched his home. A former police officer was described by Russell as saying that the images were not deemed pornographic because the boys had their pants on. The fact that Hamilton not only participated in lewd acts with the boys but also instructed many of them on how to handle rifles and handguns while on summer camping trips was equally unsettling. According to a March 1996 article by Paul Gilfeather in the Scottish Daily Record and Sunday, young people were occasionally dropped off on an island with firearms in hand and told to shoot at any animals they came across. Gilfeather further stated that during the travels, the lads would first be whipped with a steel rod before having lotion applied to their bodies. Hamilton only touched the boys once, according to one of the lads featured in the report, but he would put the lotion on us vigorously. The youngsters were then paid to remain quiet. Hamilton's actions helped spread the allegations that he was a vile pedophile. Hamilton's firearms license should be cancelled due to his unsavory character and unstable personality, according to a report by Dan McDougall for the Scotsman News. Detective Sergeant Paul Hughes, the former commander of Central Scotland Police's Child Protection Unit, penned the assessment. However, as there was no verifiable proof of any misconduct, nothing was done. He was so free to carry on operating his boys' clubs. When the rumors became too widespread, a furious Hamilton would write letters of complaint to local authorities asserting that he was not perverted and that he was the victim. Additionally, he wrote teachers and the families of the boys' letters that disparaged the groups and discouraged participation, which many people described as being threatening. At one point, he even complained about his unfair treatment in letters of protest to the Queen. Hamilton thought there was a plot to get rid of him. He accused the police, scout leaders, and not only his teachers and parents, of spreading unfavorable reports about him. In the end, Hamilton's rage gave rise to the terrible incidents on March 13, 1996. He then exacted his vengeance on the neighborhood that made an effort to keep its kids safe. Residents of Dunblane and the families of the murdered wanted explanations after the atrocity. They were curious as to how such a catastrophe could have happened in their small town. An open investigation was conducted as a result of their requests. What conditions led to the shootings was one of the main questions Lord Cullen attempted to answer. He also evaluated how to better protect the public in the future from gun misuse. The investigation turned out to be a priceless source of information because it was primarily based on police records and the testimony of those who were familiar with Hamilton. Between the 1970s and the mid-1990s, Hamilton founded and managed roughly 16 boys' clubs, the majority of which were unsupervised, according to the investigators. Furthermore, it was found that Hamilton lacked the necessary credentials to train the boys in many of the events he planned for members. This made others wonder why he had been given the go-ahead to keep running the boys' clubs in the first place. When some of the boys testified about Hamilton's mistreatment of them during the investigation, his true character was further exposed. They described how they were forced to strip to their swimwear so that they could be photographed, many of which concentrated on the groin region. When a child protested, Hamilton would make fun of them. Hamilton would pretend that the photos were shot for advertising when questioned about them by parents or the authorities, despite the fact that he saved the majority of them for his own delight. 
only two incidents were documented in Cullen's 1996 investigation, which raised the possibility that Hamilton was a pedophile. Hamilton allegedly sat down close to him and touched him on the inner of his leg, according to a 12-year-old who testified, the author claimed, but no report was ever filed, and the incident was ignored. Another 12-year-old boy testified under oath that he was molested, according to Cullen. The youngster alleged that Hamilton anally attacked him and inappropriately touched his private parts. Cullen struggled to believe the testimony since he was unable to cross-examine the youth who had previously been convicted of a significant offense of dishonesty. Evidence presented at the investigation revealed that Hamilton had planned the school shooting in advance. Hamilton made more gun and ammunition purchases than ever in the six months or so before the shooting. He spent numerous hours trying to develop his shooting precision, and his participation at gun clubs significantly grew. Hamilton was probably getting ready to go on his killing spree in advance. According to Alison McLaughlin's report from the Scottish Daily Record in Sunday in June 1996, Hamilton may have even begun preparing the massacre at the school two years before it happened. In addition, there was proof that he intended to exact revenge on up to four different classes, not just one. The evidence was provided by an unnamed nine-year-old youngster who had previously belonged to one of Hamilton's organizations in the form of written testimony. According to McLaughlin, Hamilton asked the boy questions regarding the gym's structure and the daily schedule every week for two years. Hamilton is accused of asking precise questions about the school's daily procedures, including how to go across the building into the gym, when grades 1, 4 gathered in the gym, how many fire exits there were, and other specifics. Up to a week before the massacre, Hamilton questioned the youngster. Those who spoke with Hamilton in the days before the shootings assert that he didn't behave strangely right before the incident. Hamilton's mother was described by Russell as saying that her son seemed all fine when she saw him the night before the shooting. According to reports, he made no mention of his plans for the following day. Ron Taylor, the headmaster of Dunblane Primary School, was among the first people to arrive at the horrific scene. Staff members soon followed. What they saw was so horrifying and heartbreaking that it was incomprehensible. However, they had to do what needed to be done regardless of their feelings. The crew was immediately put to work assisting the students and teachers. Up until about 15 minutes later, they comforted the dying and attended to the wounds of the injured. When they discovered the body of 45-year-old teacher Mrs. Gwen Mayer, it appeared as though she had been trying to hide children from the gunshots, according to Raymond Notarangelo's piece in the mirror. She had actually sacrificed her life to keep as many safe as she could. At the time of the shooting, Mrs. Mary Blake and Mrs. Eileen Harold were in the gym with two other instructors, even though they had received severe gunshot wounds as well. The women urgently tried to protect the kids as the bullets rained down upon them. If not for their bravery, there probably would have been more casualties. A little while afterwards, police and ambulance teams surrounded the school. Many of the victims were treated on the spot by doctors and paramedics, while others who had more serious injuries were sent immediately for treatment to the Sterling Royal Infirmary. To make sure that emergency personnel could enter the area easily, the cops blocked it off. Parents in a panic flocked around the school in the midst of the mayhem, wondering if their kids were among the injured or killed. Until later that afternoon, the majority of people were unaware of their relatives' whereabouts. Before disclosing any information, the authorities wanted to make sure they had an exact list of the injured or deceased. The waiting was agonizing. According to USA Today, one mother was so desperate that she sprinted into the school while slicing through the police's lines. When the woman discovered her shot in the neck dead daughter on the gym floor, she passed out. She was one of countless people whose lives the senseless tragedy tore apart. According to a March 1996 Scottish Daily Record and Sunday Story, pathologist Anthony Busatil was assigned to oversee the gruesome chore of coordinating the examination of those who had died in the atrocity and notifying their relatives of their deaths. The majority of the victims had one to seven gunshot wounds and the severity of their wounds was unheard of. Also in charge of conducting a post-mortem on Hamilton was Professor Busatil. The Scottish Daily Record and Sunday reports that he performed rigorous testing to look for any indications as to why Hamilton would do such a heinous crime. He examined for signs of lead poisoning, a brain tumor, alcohol, drugs, viral infection, and even a brain tumor but was unable to identify any physical cause for his deadly actions. It was obvious that psychological reasons were to blame for Hamilton's issues. Hamilton's motivations for his actions will never be known. He took this mystery with him to his grave, and it is a mystery. 
less than a week after the killing, Dunblane started making arrangements to bury their victims. To meet with the families of the deceased and the survivors, Queen Elizabeth II and Princess Anne flew to the little village. When speaking with the parents about their children, the Queen wept freely, according to a Scottish Daily Record and Sunday report from March 1996. She shared the family's sorrow and lamented the tragic loss of life, as did many others around the globe. Great Britain observed a minute of silence on March 18, 1996, in remembrance of those who had died in the Dunblane atrocity. An entire week of funerals began with the moment of silence. Many of the deceased, according to Smith, were buried in a specially dedicated location in Dunblane Cemetery. Many of the victims' families and other locals launched a push to tighten the legislation on guns and outlaw private pistol possession after the massacre. They pursued their argument all the way to Downing Street, where they spoke about it with John Major, who was the Prime Minister at the time. In response to the incident, the organization handed out a petition calling for tougher regulations, according to a Scottish Daily Record and Sunday article from April 1996. According to the story, 428,279 concerned persons signed the petition which is a sizable response by any measure. It was evident that the country's residents disapproved of the current firearms prohibitions. A few months later, a law was passed outlawing firearms larger than 22 caliber. The prohibition was then expanded in 1998 to cover handguns with smaller calibers. Owners of handguns who turned in their weapons received full reimbursement from the government. According to a September 1998 evening news report, the new regulations mandated that people requesting a gun name two referees who would testify in support of obtaining a license. The tightest gun restrictions in the world have a reputation for being in Great Britain. The new gun regulations did not please everyone. The Birmingham Evening Mail reported in August 1998 that the handgun bans had a negative impact on pistol shooting sports, gun clubs, and sellers of firearms. Furthermore, a lot of pro-gun activists bemoaned the fact that most crimes involving firearms utilized illegally obtained weapons, rarely firearms owned by licensed owners. According to Gil Marshall Andrews of the Gun Control Network, nearly all illicit guns start out legal. Therefore it's not possible to draw a tidy line between the two, was stated in Philip Johnston's July 2001 Daily Telegraph story. Marshall Andrews added that stricter gun rules should be maintained in order to reduce gun crime. However, Johnston asserted that a research from the Center for Defense Studies in London found no link between the legal possession of guns and their use by criminals and that crime instead rose by 40% in the two years after the handgun prohibition. Since the study, many people have viewed the Dunblane gun prohibitions as a failure. The Conservative Party in Britain demanded a review of the country's gun regulations by the summer of 2004. The Tories reportedly sought to relax the rule forbidding handguns and make it acceptable to use them in legitimate shooting sports, according to a Daily Record article from May 2004. Some people were concerned that loosening the regulations might have the opposite effect and even increase criminality involving firearms. Most people believed that maintaining strong gun laws was the only way to guarantee that an occurrence similar to the one that happened in Dunblane never occurs again. The families of the victims were pushing for more information about Hamilton at the same time they were contesting gun laws. By enforcing a 100-year closure order on evidence pertaining to Hamilton's actions prior to the Dunblane massacre, Lord Cullen, according to McDougall, decided to conceal sensitive information from the public. The evidence included police files regarding abuse charges at the boys' clubs, Hamilton's alleged connections to the Freemason, and reports about his use and possession of firearms. According to Tamsin Lewis' essay Hidden Secrets of the Dunblane Massacre, the families of the victims contested the 100-year ban because they thought the public had a right to access the records. Officials emphasized that the prohibition was merely implemented to safeguard the privacy of the kids whose names were mentioned in the reports. Only a handful of records, according to Neil Mackay in his March 2003 Sunday Herald report, dealt with children or named suspected abuse victims. Many people thought the prohibition was unlawful and that it had only been put in place to safeguard powerful figures like the local police and government from misconduct. Lord Advocate Colin Boyd QC authorized the publishing of four police reports from the years 1988 to 1993 to allay concerns, however, refused to make available an additional 106 other files pertaining to Hamilton's activity. The action did not allay concerns, on the contrary, it simply fueled rumors that authorities were trying to conceal important evidence. Mary Blake, a survivor of the Dunblane massacre, was married to Frank Blake, who was reported by McDougall as saying, they have not divulged the entire bunch and we want everything to be made public. We want to know what is so essential about these papers. What do they have to hide from public view? He was further reported as adding. Similar responses came from other victims' families. They have complained, but the documents have not yet been made public. 
Dr. McNorth, the parent of slain Dunblane victim Sophie North, made fresh claims of a potential cover-up in March 2004. The Cullen inquiry missed six important issues, which North listed, according to Marcello Mega's article Dunblane cover-up, including the refusal to hear testimony from Hamilton's neighbor Catherine Kerr, who saw him get out of a gray automobile outside his house the morning of the shootings. There is no record of the driver. Hamilton's movements from the time he left his house to drive to Dunblane Primary School, a 15-minute trip that took him well over three-quarters of an hour, were not accurately tracked. Why a police officer who inexplicably showed up at the school the morning of the shootings while off-duty was never asked to testify. Police's inability to recognize Hamilton as a pedophile who almost definitely sent photos of almost naked boys that he took at camps. It wasn't determined who Hamilton's police allies were. Police cars were frequently seen stopping outside of his house, according to several witnesses. The failure to look into connections between Hamilton and the Queen Victoria School, a military school in Dunblane with a small shooting range that Hamilton used and where a former instructor claims that students were abused, links that were discovered by three witnesses, calls for a new investigation into Hamilton, the shootings, and the authorities' investigations have been made in response to the claims. The families of the victims have demanded public access to all of the information available concerning Hamilton. It is only then that they might finally be able to put to rest the nightmare that has haunted them for almost a decade.